Okay, welcome to chapter five, and we're studying Russia. Now, I must admit, I am a child of the 70s, and Russia, when I was growing up, was presented as essentially our clear-cut enemy. We were still deep in the Cold War, and so that's what I associate with the USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Uh, they were the defined enemy. Uh, in more recent times, as a result of the 2016 presidential election, Russia's role and its relationship with respect to America is not quite as clearly defined. So that's one thing to keep in mind as you go through this chapter. Another thing to keep in mind is, um, again, going back to my childhood, I played a lot of Risk. If you ever played the game Risk, um, one of the challenges of that game is to, of course, conquer as much territory as you possibly can. But then you'll also need to defend that territory. And it turns out that as you expand, as you gain more and more countries, you also have more points from which you can be attacked. And the challenge becomes, how do I defend myself? How do I position enough armies at my borders, all my borders, to resist attack? It's one thing to keep in mind when you start uh, reading about Chapter 5 and reading about Russia is it's the biggest country on Earth. And so there is a challenge as far as defending itself. There's a lot of points of entry um, for Russia, a lot of possible vul vulnerabilities, but also think about trying to keep a coherent and cohesive population when you cover that much geographic space and you involve so many different languages, cultural groups, religious groups. Um, how do you keep a single country together when it is that far flung? So just a couple things to, to kind of keep in mind as you're going through the chapter. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the physiography, the physical geography of Russia. Now, I already mentioned the fact that Russia is really huge. You can see what a large, large land area takes up. And it's also rather varied when it comes to its terrain. This is a topographic map. That means that it shows the topography of Russia. And the, as you can tell by the legend here, the key, um, areas that are green are right around sea level. And so we see we have these large plains area, uh, but then we also have some mountainous terrain. We have the Ural Mountains that kind of divide the far western part of Russia from the eastern sections of Russia. And then as we move farther and farther east, we get into the central Siberian plateau and then some mountainous terrain in far eastern Russia. So uh, it just kind of gives you an idea as to not only the, the physical size of the country, but also the variation in topography that is seen in Russia. It's sort of useful to put Russia in the global context. So here's actually the world map. And first of all, you can see the, the sheer size of Russia compared to individual countries, as well as you can see its position. Notice how far north it is. Um, that is a real challenge for, for Russia. It's a big country, but a, there's a lot of essentially unused space in Russia, and there's good reason that it is not used because it's so far north, it's so cold, the climate is so harsh that uh, while there are mineral wealth and natural resources there, um, it's really not possible to farm. Without farming, it's tough to get much in the way of any, any civilization to develop. Okay, so we've already touched upon these a little bit, but these are the physiographic regions of Russia. Notice there, this is the same map as on figure 5-2 on page 198 of your textbook. And for our purposes, clearly the, the Russian plain is perhaps the most important uh, of these physiographic regions. The reason being that's where Moscow is, that's where St. Petersburg is, that's where the, the, the cities that we're very familiar with uh, are located, and the, the majority of the Russian population are located. Of course, we can't forget kind of this transition uh, region in the, the southern part of Russia. And the rest of the country, as we've already kind of described, you have the Ural Mountain region, which separates the Russian plain with the West Siberian plain, another area that's a little, little lower in elevation. And then it starts to climb a little bit. We get into the Central Siberian Plateau and then even more mountainous terrain uh, in far eastern Russia, where the eastern highlands are. Uh, of course, we can't forget some of the far reaches on the uh, eastern front of Russia, the, the Kamchatka Peninsula and Sakhalin Island also make up the far eastern sections. Very, very low population density in that part of Russia.
Okay, what I think is most interesting about this section is that very very rarely do you ever hear of things like the Kara C or the Laptev C. Uh, you know, some of you have probably heard of the Baron C before, but these others uh, you probably don't hear of. And the question is, well, why? Well, part of the reason is that they're ice bound most or some of the year. And uh, so therefore they're not really that important as far as shipping. There's no large, civil, no, no large uh, cities uh, along these uh, seas you know, for good reason, because again, they're ice bound a lot of the time. Uh, that could change as you, as you read your textbook uh, with the, with the uh, current global warming situation. Um, Russia stands to actually benefit from global warming uh, as, as the northern portion of the country, which is largely inaccessible and not really that usable, uh, becomes warmer. That's going to change the, uh, the physical characteristics. So something worth something worth watching. Another thing that's very interesting here in the West Siberian Plain, they make mention of the Ob River. That's the Ob River right in here. Actually, it flows northward. We're so used to seeing being Americans, we see you know, the Mississippi flowing from Minnesota down into Louisiana. We think all, all rivers flow from north to south, and that's not true. Rivers flow from higher terrain to lower terrain. Gravity wins. And uh, so in this case, the higher terrain is to the south, the lower terrain is to the north, and therefore the Ob, Ob River flow, flows from south to north. As you move eastward in Russia, you get closer to the Pacific Ring of Fire, uh, that area of extreme volcanic and earthquake activity associated with subduction zones. The fact that you have the Pacific Ocean plates that are being subducted under different parts of continental plates. And that's uh, occurring in far eastern Russia near the Kamchatka Peninsula as well as Sakhalin Island. Uh, the book describes on page 107 Kamchatka Island, or I'm sorry, Kamchatka Peninsula as being home to 60 volcanoes uh, and being one of the most difficult places to live on Earth. Uh, it's essentially uh, an outpost with very little connectivity to the rest of Russia. Uh, there's no overland route to get to Kamchatka Peninsula. Uh, same thing with Sakhalin Island, also very difficult to, uh, to access, but it's also very important to the Russian economy because of oil and gas reserves. So this has actually been a, a island that has been fought over uh, in the past uh, between Japan and Russia. Times the various climate regions in Russia. And one thing you should remember from when we just studied Europe was how Europe, at least portions of Europe, were influenced by the Gulf Stream and the fact that uh, the access of re to relatively warm waters moderated the climates of certainly the British Isles, as well as portions of uh, far northern Europe, such as Scandinavia, really benefited. It was, it was warmer there, more moderate there than it otherwise should be because of the warming influence of the nearby Atlantic Ocean. Now for Russia, it is such a large land mass that a lot of the inland areas do not benefit from the maritime influence uh, of nearby waters. So a lot of the central portion of Russia, you can see the coding here, uh, DF uh, essentially stands for no dry season. And then the, so the C there stands for a short, cool summer. So that's, that's the way you read uh, the figure 2A3, but you can see that a lot of Russia uh, experiences a very, very difficult, very difficult climate. Okay, so here's the, the population distribution as of 2014. Uh, in Russia, and you can see large, large portions of the country are essentially uninhabited. You know, this is a lot of northern central Siberia, uh, essentially very few people living there. Um, notice here's your 60 degree latitude line coming on through here. So you can see that uh, a lot of the a lot of this non-populated area is either close to or above the Arctic Circle. Uh, the most populous regions here are in the eastern port. I'm sorry, the, the uh, Western portions of Russia, as well as we have some areas of population density along the southern tier of Russia. But as far as the northern extremes, very, very low populations. We'll see this as a similar situation uh, in the next chapter when we get into chapter three or the, the next module when we get to chapter module three.
when we're studying North America, you're going to see a similar population distribution uh, with respect to Canada because the northern portions of Canada extend either into or above the Arctic Circle. Here's a nice side-by-side -side graphic showing the population distribution as well as the climates. And you know, these are good questions to ask yourself. You know, you know first of all, why are the, the why is the population distribution the way that it is, and what are the climate considerations that would account for that? Um, you know, why wouldn't you have a lot of population in northern Siberia? And a lot of it has to do with the climate and the climate's influence on agriculture. The fact that you don't really have arable land at those high latitudes and you don't have much of a growing season so uh kind of answer those questions for yourself another good question to ask is despite the fact that most of northern siberia is not populated notice we have these little outposts these little red dots popping up out here in kamchatka peninsula and other locations why why on earth would anyone live there good question to ask as I mentioned a couple of slides ago, um, when it comes to climate change and global warming, there is the potential for uh, an advantage for Russia. And the question is, well, why? Well, with less and less ice cover in the Arctic Ocean, that's going to open up some of those Arctic ports. And we could even see a, a passable uh, trade route through the Bering Strait. Um, so you know, that's one thing is that it's gonna open up shipping. Another thing is that it's going to open up perhaps oil and gas reserves um, as roads can be built and pipelines can be built into these more remote locations. Um, we could see more oil and gas production from those regions, which of course brings along economic prosperity. Okay, so what are the downsides? It sounds great, right? Global warming, improving things for Russia. The downside of course is that with drilling with pipelines, with roads, et cetera, et cetera, you're going to have environmental disruption. Uh, human communities, animal communities, uh, vegetation communities will be affected. Um, with all that extra shipping in the Arctic, there is the potential for oil spills and pipelines. You, you, know, you always have pipeline leaks and, su and such. So there are environmental downsides to the economic upside. Okay, so it's one thing to have natural resources and mineral riches and that sort of thing. It's another thing to actually be able to access them and transport them to where they actually are used. Because of course, natural resources do you no good unless you can use them. And that's one of the challenges for, for Russia is that some of their areas of uh, natural resource uh, richness uh, are in relatively inaccessible areas. Notice you have portions of just off the, the Arctic Ocean Again, we talked about the fact that this area is icebound much of the time. Uh, this area of, of, of oil and gas in eastern Siberia uh, appears to be untapped. Well, why is that? Because it's so remote um, that it, it's difficult to build a long, long pipeline to get that and get that oil and gas anywhere useful. And the cost benefit, you know, obviously it's a benefit to be able to sell those those resources, but at what cost? And uh, so those are always considerations that a government must must uh, take uh, into consideration before they start tapping into some of these resources. I encourage you to go through this animation to uh, learn more about the Trans-Siberian Railroad that goes all the way from Moscow to Vladivostok or Vladivost Vladivostok, however they pronounce it on the video. Um, and one thing that you should probably keep in mind is that you're going to see that the rail line goes through a lot of the developed regions of southern Russia. And there's a good chicken egg question. Um, did, the, did the manufacturing centers and, and the population centers result from the fact that there was a railroad line that went through them? Or was it the other way around? Did the railroad line, uh, was it built to respond to the locations of those population and manufacturing centers, et cetera, et cetera. And then you're going to learn more about some of the early uh, efforts toward empire, some of the early czars, Peter the Great, uh, St. Petersburg, of course, was named after him, uh, Catherine the Great, and how the Russian empire grew uh, until the end 
of the czarist period. So that's going to Okay, so through the 19th century and into the early 20th century, um, as you read, uh, the excesses of the czarist uh, way of rule uh, just became too much for the Russian people. And uh, anytime you have such a disparity in, in income uh, and opportunity, you're going to have eventually a revolution. And that's what happened in the early 20th century. The, the communist revolution uh, took hold and 1917 and changed the structure of Russia as we see here. Russia became divided into 15 Soviet socialist republics. So when I was growing up, uh, Russia was known as what we called Russia offhandedly was actually the USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Notice this slide. Um, is entitled a phantom federation because a federation includes it's supposed to be uh, a sharing of power between central government and subdivisions so uh, america we've got a federalist system in the sense that we've got the federal government the the government based in washington dc but we also have uh, a shared amount of power between the federal government as well as the states and with the soviet union um, even though it's perhaps described as a federation, uh, there's not as much power given to those individual republics. A lot of the control uh, came from Moscow, so that's why it's described here as a phantom federation. So what makes communism different from, say, Western capitalism? Well, part of it has to do with the amount of planting, planning top-down. Uh, capitalism quite often is a bottom-up approach. You find out what resources are available in your area, what um, what items can be produced in your area, and that's where, and that's that's how it kind of grows from there. Whereas in the communist system, at least the Soviet experiment in communism, uh, there was a lot of central planning, uh, in which some of the communist leaders decided which cities were going to produce which products, um, irrespective of, of whether the natural resources to produce those products were available uh, nearby. And so it was a very top-down approach. Same thing with agriculture, um, very, uh, very top-down, very planned. And hopefully you picked up on, um, as the USSR developed, um, the structural challenges. You know, again, it's a very large country. Uh, when they started to do the, the central planning, uh, that meant that certain cities were, were uh, designed to make certain products, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so people were rewarded to go to some of these far-flung outposts. Uh, you know, so essentially citizens were moved uh, into certain locations, you know, moved around, sometimes with financial incentives um, in order to live in some of these far-flung outposts. And then when the whole thing collapsed, now those incentives went away. And so not only do you have the dissolution of this USSR, all these these republics that uh, uh, now are independent, but now you have people who had moved there for financial reasons that no longer have that financial subsidy and no real reason to stay on where they're at. So a lot of upheaval um, resulted from the dissolution of the USSR. Now, why did it happen? Why did the USSR fail? Well, essentially, the, the Cold War cost them so much uh, trying to keep up with the U.S. in, in uh, defense spending. Uh, the Cold War essentially drained those resources. And, uh, and there was still that ongoing challenge of trying to maintain a certain amount of unity among all these dispar disparate republics, uh, where you have a lot of differences in language and ethnicity, religions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, really tore at this united Russia and eventually was uh, aided its demise.
as is, as is the case with any country that has any history of imperialism, the more ground, the more territory you conquer, uh, you also conquer, you bring in other cultures, other traditions. And this is the ongoing challenge for Russia is that you know it has an imperial past uh, where it tried to take over areas and it still wants to maintain the, that, that uh, expansive uh, boundary. But the challenge is how to how to incorporate those other traditions and those other cultures into one unified culture. That's an ongoing challenge, not only for Russia, but for a lot of countries, um, is how to bring in all the different cultural groups and make them all feel like they are part of the same country. So as Russia moves forward, uh, we've already discussed some of the challenges. Um, you know, first of all, it's not a great manufacturer. It's got a lot of natural resources, and that's li largely how its economy is based. Uh, another ongoing challenge is just again the huge size of the nation. It's tough to keep it all consolidated, and especially for some of the republics that now border Europe, uh, there's a lot of pull. It used to be that that those those bordering those transition zones were under the rule of Moscow, but now those areas have different options. They can start developing uh, trading relationships with other countries in the European realm. And so that becomes a problem. Um, and so part of the question for those boundary locations is, um, you know, how much Russian influence, how much uh, influence from Moscow uh, do those now independent states want to uh, continue to have. As we've already discussed sort of ad nauseum, uh, Russia is really big and, and even uh, in the post-Soviet era, you know, where you've shrugged off some of the other republics like Ukraine, etc., etc., even Russia itself is still really big, and that poses a challenge, uh, especially because the population density is much, much different. It, it varies quite a bit. The, the population density is much greater in the West and very, very sparsely populated in the East. In fact, the uh, figure in your book, uh, figure 20, 2B, 2B2, um, shows not only the difference in Spartan, uh, the difference in amount of population, but also the the trend in population. The fact that there has been a decrease in uh, most of the regions, um, with the exception of the far western uh, regions, and so that's a concern as you're just having a change of, of population, even ghost towns in some cases. Now, in, in the post-Soviet era, there was a choice to be made, as is described on your, in your book on page uh, 132, uh, where Russia could have, have continued a very centralized system, uh, but instead it went for a slightly more democratic, progressive federal system. Um, so that means that there's less control at the level of the state, or in, the case, in this case, Moscow. Um, more control is handed off into the, the, the regions. But even as is properly pointed out, uh, even in a federal system like the United States, there are a lot of uh, stresses and strains between federal control versus states control, or what's called states' rights. Of course, the politics of Russia continue to change, um, and with the ascendance of Vladimir Putin, uh, there was another revamping of the system, uh, in which case, even though the, the federal system was maintained, regional governors, governors were appointed rather than elected. And that is sometimes uh, concerning in the sense that he would put uh, political allies, uh, and you wouldn't necessarily have uh, the, the voice of the people uh, as far as who winds up ruling those different regions. In the post-Soviet era, there has been a decrease in population in Russia, particularly among men, uh, which is unusual considering for the rest of the world there's uh, increased life expectancies, whereas in uh, Russia there's been a decrease in life expectancy, particularly among men. 
Okay, so you can see that Russia is one of the BRICS. It's one of these emerging markets along with Brazil, India, and China. Um, why, is it, why does it struggle? Why is Russia precarious when it comes to its economics? Well, partly because, again, it doesn't have much of a manufacturing sector. It tends to uh, produce more raw materials. Uh, it does do uh, some, some banking and that sort of thing. It doesn't have that much in the way of uh, uh, product that it's manufacturing. Uh, another issue is its political instability and in some cases, you know, concerns about human rights abuses. Uh, foreign companies are not willing to do a whole lot of investing if they're not sure if they're going to be able to recoup their investment or if their investment could get uh, kind of squandered by government corruption, that sort of thing. So there are a lot of uh, additional hurdles uh, to Russia's economy being as uh, successful as a lot of the Russians would like it to be. Whereas parts of Russia are shrinking, at least population-wise, Moscow is growing by leaps and bounds. Um, a lot of new construction and an entirely new region, a new Moscow district, is currently under development. In addition to Moscow, there are other metropolitan areas that make up the Russian core, including St. Petersburg. Of course, this is named after Peter the Great. It eventually became known as Leningrad, Leningrad in the early 20th century. Um, that's the second most populous city in Russia. Uh, Moscow is around 12 million. I believe St. Petersburg is in the vicinity of 5 million people. Uh, but you can kind of see the, the relative location of St. Petersburg. Uh, it's in the far northwestern part of the country and actually has a very important port uh, there because it is an open water port and that helps as far as shipping and such. The other, another area that's important in the Russian core is what's called the Volga region or the Povolzhia. Um, uh, and the main city there is Volgograd, which at one time was called Stalingrad during a during Stalin's regime. Okay, moving further east, we get into the Urals. The Urals are right in here. In fact, the Urals actually extend farther to the north, but as far as importance to uh, in, in, uh, industrial development, it's really the southern part of the Urals that's important. Now, the Urals is a north-south mountain chain. Uh, it's not so tall that it prevents uh, really east-west travel, which is which is good. And this area is actually very important because of the resources inherent in mountainous terrain. Um, it's very important as far as Russian industry. Uh, and as we for, continue to move further east, uh, again, you're getting farther and farther away from some of those main population centers, some of those main uh, manufacturing centers, and therefore, like in the Lake Baikal area, um, you have issues as far as access uh, it just gets more and more remote. Make sure you check out this video about Lake Baikal and the environmental challenges that it is facing. Now, Lake Baikal is the largest freshwater reservoir and uh, supports a lot of life. Um, and uh, it's currently facing a lot of challenges from, from, from uh, pollution discharge into the lake that's threatening the, the, whole, the whole life web. Continuing further east, we get into Siberia. Now, Siberia, we, we sort of think of as being this you know, barren, desolate place, and for the most part, it is. It's very, very large, larger than the contiguous United States, um, very low population, uh, but also very rich in resources. And so, again, this is an area that's prone or, or uh, poised for development if it could be more accessible. And as I already, as was mentioned in uh, Chapter 2A, with global change, global climate change, and global warming uh, in the offing, Siberia could be opened up in the future to greater development. Going further east, we get into the far east, which includes the Kamchatka Peninsula, it includes Sakhalin uh, Island. And uh, these are, again, fairly uh, low population. In fact, the Kamchatka Peninsula, as was already mentioned, is actually cut off from overland transport or travel. Uh, but these are potentially important trading locations. 
And it's called Transcaucasian because here are the Caucasus Mountains that kind of cut through the middle of this region. Um, now this area is long been a, an area uh, of difficulty of strife uh, for Russia. You know, part of the reason being you know, it's made up of a lot of small little republics, each of them wanting to be independent, though culturally uh, independent, so often religiously different from their neighbors. Uh, so this is just an area of, of ongoing concern for Russia. Um, most recently in, in the news was Chechnya. Um, Is Russia too large to be ruled effectively as a single state? Might there be some ideal size for the proper functioning of a democracy? That's one thing we've gone back to several times, is the fact that Russia is just so huge. What form of government is most effective in dealing with such a large geographic region? Uh, there's also another point. One in seven Russian villages has been abandoned and is now a ghost town. Again, that's reflected by the uh, it's a reflection of the uh, decreasing population. Another point they make is, according to a recent poll marking the 20th anniversary of the Soviet Union's demise, 70% of Russians agreed that, that the changes since 1991 had not benefited ordinary people. Now that's a real problem, and that's why there has been a, a, uh, a resurgence of almost a pining for the old socialist or communist days, because there was, there was at least control and stability in the country. Uh, even if it was somewhat authoritarian, um, when in times of trouble, in times of uh, of unrest, people look for stability. And, and since it ha occurred within their lifetime, a lot of folks have that institutional memory of a more stable uh, Russia, which some folks pined for. And then finally, this is in terms of economic development, Russia is by far the most unpredictable of the four BRICs, uh, again, uh, largely because of the nature of the Russian economy being so dependent upon exporting some of their natural resources.